This is the third uh, uh, discussion group and, and um, uh, seminar that the Oxford Centre has, has run. And uh, the first one uh, was on the history of philanthropy. Um, and uh, the second by Zoltan, who's with us tonight, on, uh, shall I say, the economics of philanthropy. And uh, now we're going to uh, delve into um, the questions of the family and philanthropy and uh, try and understand the different complexions of how families um, leave a legacy and, and mobilise themselves in a philanthropic way. And of course there's a, a great deal of expertise in the room um, and as you heard going around the table uh, we have people here with uh, a deep understanding from uh, professional viewpoints we also have people who have expertise from uh, an academic side, both in studying and in teaching others um, uh, about how philanthropy uh, occurs and is managed. And the desire that we have from the Oxford Centre's point of view is to share lessons, but also to cultivate questions that we um, might take forward. And this. If I keep an academic's hat on at the moment, I think I can safely say that this is an under-attended to area in the academic world. So I cannot put my hand on a body of literature that has the sort of substance that many other fields have, um, which means that academics haven't spent time considering and sharing ideas and marshalling evidence in the way that we might uh, expect. And uh, that, that's a shame because there are some really important and interesting issues, um, models, questions, um, ideas that need to be sorted through here. Um, uh, and we have the opportunity uh, by mixing people from different professional backgrounds and people with the academic wherewithal in one room to both surface questions and evidence. And we won't certainly answer all questions that get surfaced tonight. <laughs> but uh, it is the duty of some of us to help marshal those so that the Oxford Centre can breathe life into um, uh, a more dedicated um, and structured um, academic endeavour. Uh, because uh, there are, as you know, uh, quite a few centres um, of philanthropy with different viewpoints and, and some of them um, with more academic leaning than others. But this one uh, wants to substantiate uh, a body of evidence um, upon which we can gain uh, a, be a deeper understanding of practice, what works and what doesn't work, um, which can then be marshalled in all sorts of different ways, um, you know, educationally as well as into policies and so on. So you can help with that um, by sharing your questions. <laughs> <laughs> and please do as we as we go through the evening, um, and and that will help build out um, where the direction of, of travel. It's enough from me, I think. Um, are we happy to to, to begin? I think um, Inika, you've kindly um, uh, said uh, who you are, but you've got a, a great pedigree because um, you've uh, been a, a, a practitioner and a professional in the uh, legal uh, side. You've also got a PhD. Um, in uh, in this area and you've been working with families and and, and guiding people uh, and you're going to share with us some of those viewpoints and I think I should hand over to you I'm going to sit to one side so at least I can have the benefit of seeing what comes up on on the screen and um, please the floor's yours thank you very much well as I said I'm a lawyer and a tax attorney practicing over more than 25 years and my personal commitment to this subject, I want you to know that because it's important for the evening, I think, is that as a young lawyer, I had the experience already of family businesses that really went wrong, ended in conflicts, ended in entropy. And I also had um, perhaps the luck of working with a large NGO, which um, the international um, center of that NGO was established in Amsterdam at the time. 
And um, I felt that those two different types of clients were completely in contradiction to each other. And uh, when I became a partner, uh, more or less around my 30th age, I thought, well, it will be my mission to bring those different worlds a little bit more together. And so that the family businesses are not only evolving around the theme, uh, how to make as much as possible profits, because that was, in my view, the roots of many of those problems that I came across, but also that the NGOs that I had seen by that time um, would become more professional in the sense of the same profit-making motive. motive. So for me, perhaps, uh, I started my own practice five years ago after being a partner of that larger law firm for many years. Um, and uh, I, I also mentioned it, private client and charity, so that's what I'm doing. Just to start with, I saw in a rather recent publication of Camden, you know Camden probably to publisher, um, that here in the UK, three quarter of all British family businesses do not have an effective plan of succession. Even though many family businesses are like to have some form of a succession plan, it's an exception that these plans are communicated to and shared with other family members in a meaningful way. Since two thirds of the United Kingdom's businesses are family businesses, employing nine million people, this is a very worrying observation. Respondents indicated, this is still Camden, the following factors as a cause for the absence of effective succession planning. Fear of growing old and letting go, lacking a suitable successor, finding it hard to discuss difficult matters within the family. Well, I've just dared to care, dared to say uh, that wealth transfer from wealthy families to us another generation may be referred to as a wealth transfer curse because much research, not so many academic research though, I have to admit, has been done into this problem um, universally characterized by adagia such as you know them all from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. There's a uniform worldwide failure, failure rate of 70% for wealth transfers to the next generation. And the question then of course is, and Charles Postum <coughs> posted already to me, what means failure? Well, failure in this context means the lose of control of family assets and harmony after the transfer to the next generation. Um, and the strange thing is, looking into this research, that this percentage of 70%, more or less 70%, is consistent across geographies, economic cycles, so whether it's, a, um, whether, whether it's a positive or a negative conjuncture, tax regimes and historical periods. And that means if only 70% survives, that after two generations there's only 10% left. So only 10% survives, you can say, the third generation. If we look globally again, and we have to say that 60 to 95 percent of all businesses in the world, the 60 to 95 depends on what country you're looking at, are controlled or owned by families. So if we're thinking a little while on this, then we're talking about a huge issue. But is that inevitable? We hope not, of course, but as a lawyer, I have a vision on this. Look at this picture. This is a picture of a traditional legacy. What does it say to you? <coughs> this, traditional, this traditional legacy. Do we see trust? Do we see good communication? Harmony? A shared future? Let me look into it a little bit further. We see a father who is signing papers there are two family members watching him. The man at the right looks rather confident. There is a man behind the father who is not looking very happy. And there are some other persons, also the ladies in the room, have very different emotional views of this whole process. Or are we, doing, or are we seeing unconfirmed expectations? Sense of entitlements? 
that might be there or might not be there. And a sole parental vision on the future. Sometimes a picture does say more than a thousand words. And I don't have copyright on this picture. <laughs> it's from Step. Well, this research, and, and of course the sources are always, always relevant. This is one of the books um, that shows the research. It's a, it's a group called the Williams Group in the US. They have done their own research and published books on it. <coughs> um, so what is relevant? Um, first of all, from, from the perspective of a lawyer, do we have to conclude that estate planners, because if you have to refer to me as a type of lawyer, then you typically would consider me an estate and trust lawyer. Do we have to conclude that estate planners are not doing their work properly? Obviously, that depends on the ambition that estate planners set for themselves. If the traditional estate planner only focuses on the technical capital <coughs> transfer and minimization of taxation, uh, well, we miss the essence of the challenge of capital preservation in the long term. Traditional estate planning is based, and that's exactly the fi what the figures showed, is based on a one-dimensional advisory relationship with the leader of a family business, typically referred to as a patriarch, which additionally is also characterized by discretion and secrecy. We have a client-attorney relationship which is based on secrecy and discretion and not on an open relation with the entire family. And furthermore, from a historical perspective, this uh, proverbial patriarch nowadays has more capital and more freedom of choice than ever. It's not evident that family members will be successor of the business or that they will inherit family capital. Even so, patriarchs expect, articulated or not, their children to remain a family for the family business. Discussing the future inheritance of the patriarch is a taboo in most families. Generally, the focus is not, and now I take a jump on what's coming, on dynastic imaging, in which the following question should be central. What is the function of the capital embodied in the family business? So, and the real interesting thing um, on this research is to see the difference in perception between the risks that the same patriarch, if you ask him, fears and the risk he should fear. Um, the risks one fears are not at all similar to the risks that cause the failure of those capital transfers to the next generation. One is just barely aware of the real risks that threaten family businesses and capital in the future. Look at this for a while. If we, if not we, the Williams group again, ask families what is it you think will bite us? Then 37% respond that the threats they face are investment specific risks. Another 20% thinks economy, it's all in the economy and also the financial markets, which are a huge risk to the, to the future growth of their business or the maintenance of their business. 16% refers to political and also tax risks, so there are risks in the development of tax legislation. The tax may increase. There, of course, there are many other reasons to flow tax, legal advice of attorneys, for example, wars that might arise. However, for tonight, most important is only 7% mentions the family dynamics and relationship problems. Well, what is the cause, however, of this? I call it all sometimes also the Midas curse, and you know why. Uh, research, the same research, shows that in reality, and those figures are astounding, 60% is due to a lack of communication and trust within the family unit. 60%. 25% of failure is due, due to unprepared hears, and happily us, only 2% is due to professional oversight or error. So we are doing our jobs very well, aren't we? <laughs> well, that's basically. What is needed to combat the curse? Um, 
Well, in my uh, circles, the circles of lawyers, it has now become a more or less a widespread misconception, in my view, that in order to achieve this, to combat the curse, a family statute, a family constitution or a family charter has to be drawn up by the family themselves, of course, in consultation with an advisor. And I'm only talking in this in reference to what I see from my practice in the Netherlands, it might be completely different in the UK. In a family constitution, it is stated how the family relates to each other and what the management of the family capital looks like. And uh, it, it occasionally mentions uh, a number of enforceable or unenforceable rules within the family, however, that do not necessarily contribute to, co to cohesion within the family and it could even result in a family believing they have everything well organized because they have a proper family constitution in their drawer and we won't have any conflicts anymore. I've already seen um, headings in the new papers in the Netherlands from very well-known families saying that, well, we don't have any future problems in our family. We have prepared a very nice family constitution. Thank you. Next problem, please. So I don't think that will be I don't say a family constitution cannot be helpful if you use it in the right context. That, that's, that's another thing. But it's not a solution to the problem in itself. And certainly not as a document or as a quasi-transaction. It looks like a contract. Um, to achieve... Um, so I don't think that the solution is in, is in anything that has anything to do with lawyers. Certainly not about contracts. It's about how the family is functioning, actually. And to achieve a truly effective foresight, it will be necessary to let the family itself reflect on the, on the values. On the values, it inextricably links to the enterprise and also to the capital that is associated with it. It's essential for families to understand that the issues they have to overcome are qualitative and not quantitative. So we're talking about the meaning of wealth, the purpose of wealth, why do we have this, why do we want to maintain this, or why do we want to share this within the family, what's our mission, values. That, those are very difficult things for many business people and also for lawyers to address. How are we doing that? We are not able to grasp that. We are not able to write it down. We have to discuss this, but how are we going to do that? Well, it also, it's also required to focus on the human, not only on the financial, but also on the human and the, and the intellectual wealth of a family. In fact, it's necessary to re-energize each generation uh, to begin again as a sort of quasi first generation because of course inherent to the problem of um, the curse is that the second generation has already the advantage of the hard work of the first generation and um, which makes them perhaps a little bit more lazier in the whole process and for the third generation that may even add to another to another level of thinking so it's it's essential that each generation will be re-energized to act as a new first generation in their own thinking. In this process of creating values, which is not so easy, it's essential that all the families should be integrated and they should be educated alongside um, in order to, uh, to, so children should be educated, but also the younger family members should be educated in this whole process alongside. With the ultimate view of creating harmony, understanding within the family, well, this is all, these, these are all the soft factors and not the things that lawyers are feeling very, very satisfied with through exchange within them versus the unconfirmed expectations, the sense of entitlements which are not concrete and the sole parental vision on the future I just described in relation to that nasty picture. How are we going to do this? Well, family philanthropy is, and there we are, perhaps the best, I don't know, 
too. If there are any other tools, we would like to hear it. But in my view, family philanthropy is a very powerful tool to address all, this, all these issues. And why is that? Um, well, again, the, this proverbial patriarch sits behind his desk and says, well, even if he understands the message, um, how should I do this? Um, he would like to discuss these matters with his family. The best way to do it is, is normally for him to do it in an indirect way. Preferably not to just sit down and talk to each other, but to work on something, to do something together. That is what entrepreneurs are really good at. Most family businesses that have been successful, and I think a number of them are here throughout generations, all have solid family governance and are, are almost with exception active in philanthropy. And that might not be a coincidence. Again, this is not academically researched. Um, as James Huge, he is also a specialist in, a, in this area, describes it, families learn more about long-term wealth preservation through giving than they do through spending or accumulating. That's very interesting if you think about it. They, they learn more about wealth preservation through giving. That sounds very counterintuitive, isn't it? But I think he's right. It leads to human and intellectual capital growth if people start to work together on family philanthropy. It can also provide um, um, for the children to create, well that's a very important part of it, for, for younger members in the family to have a, uh, a healthy relation to the value of money. Um, the reason for that is that the practicing philanthropy with family members requires the exact same thing that is necessary to create the basis for trust and cohesion in the family. It teaches younger family members the value of capital and what important things you can do with it. They learn to engage in a functional relationship with capital which prevents them from affluenza the word I like so much in this area. This is good for the identity and self-confidence of the children and it prepares them in a responsible manner for the position they will hold later. Doing something back for society as a family actually provides a basis for good capital planning in the future. So it seems a win-win concept. Also it's the first forum for a family for learning to work together rather than the patriarch being very active in the business and not sharing the information and his business activities with his family members. There's lots of, of examples of that. And um, last but not least, successful philanthropy creates new heroic, heroic stories and that brings pride within the family. Family members can be pride of our family has done this. We have achieved this and that's why we want to stay together. Okay, <clears throat> best practices. Well, if I've been thinking about best practices, um, then I would say one of the best practices certainly is it should be all in the family. That means excluding some family members from a family philanthropic activity um, is not the right way because that's the essential part of this practice. Certainly the governance between the family business and a family foundation, that's normally how I, how I refer to it, should not be the same, therefore. So the governance of the foundation should include also other family members. Ideally, also children from a certain age should be involved in, in the philanthropic activities and certainly also the spouses. It may also be a beautiful way to include the past president of the family business who is looking for another role in the whole situation. It can provide an additional neutral governance system. We all know the governance issues between a family business and the family. A family philanthropic vehicle can add a governance system to the whole situation. And we can make that very complex. We can also add 
family, well, call it as you like, family councils, um, protectors that have a, a link to both the family business and the family foundations, just to make a whole system of a balanced system between the family and the business itself. Accountability and impact is an important part of a best practice. Uh, I think talking about family philanthropy, it is easier to speak about impact investing and venture philanthropy kinds of activities. Um, a good question could be why are you talking about philanthropy? What about investment? We can do the same things if we are investing. If Why shouldn't we be investing together rather than be in philanthropy? Well, it's about the purpose of what you're doing. The public purpose of what you're doing is key. Uh, but, but certainly for entrepreneurs it's easier to, to, to talk about impact investing and venture philanthropy. So most of the time we start indeed with that kind of philanthropy. Um, furthermore, I would consider a philanthropic activity as a step up for involvement of family members to other stages of planning, also in relation to the business. And later on, to the transfer of the whole business to the next generation. So it's certainly not an end stage. It's a tool to go into another phase. A recent report, it's called Staying Power, um, reports that now 47% of world's large family businesses, well, depends on what is the definition of large, I refer to the report, have a family foundation. That's quite considerable. That's not a best practice, but I just wanted it to mention this to you as a fact. Well, I'll come back to estate planning, um, because that's my profession, after all. I think estate practitioners should define uh, their goals a little bit different. As I said, traditionally estate planning, and I think the traditional estate planning is part of the problem. That's why I mentioned this as a more innovative way of looking at planning, and I call it legacy planning, should not just look at minimizing taxation. Um, it should look for a long-term <laughs> legacy, and with long-term I mean more than three generations. Um, it should be a way of planning that it uh, looks for protection of the family against poverty during at least those three generations. It should seek for opportunities for children to grow meaningful and productive adults. And I, refer, I like to refer to the saying, instead of sailing on a sea of riches, children can experience an ocean of needs. Also, I shared with Charles, he exactly mentioned the same proverb. Uh, they, should do, they should have enough to do anything, not so much to do nothing. And of course, that one is of Warren Buffett. Um, the end result of that is minimalizing conflicts. It's a purpose of legacy planning to minimize conflict. <laughs> because if you look back to the 60%, conflict is the main area of concern for the maintenance of wealth over the generations. And this whole process of legacy planning is indeed a process. It's not a transaction. Unlike traditional estate planning, it's focusing on an estate plan, on a transaction with the family, how are we going to, to transfer the ownership to the next generation. It's also dynastic planning. Well, that's very short. Um, something about strategies. Um, now we're boiling a, li boiling a little bit down onto <coughs> how should this philanthropy be exercised? Well, I don't think there is a clear answer to that. There are many forms of exercising philanthropy. First of all, there is strategic philanthropy. What I mean by strategic philanthropy is that it can add strategically to the interests of, the, of a business. <clears throat> My example is IKEA. You know, IKEA has been accused a number of years ago for child labor. They use child labor, at least that that's what they, for, what they were accused for, and not so long after that, they, um, they changed their charitable activities 
into a huge uh, Stichting Inca Foundation that distributes substantial amounts to NGOs in the world that support the interests of children. So that's highly strategic, I would say. Um, it can be philanthropy that's independent from the business and has nothing to do with the business purposes. It can be endowed. Um, in that case, I would say it is uh, vital in the context of the subject of tonight that um, one is searching for an overlapping interest within the family's members rather than that each family member has its own typical interest that it would like to pursue but because then it's not then it's not fulfilling the requirements of the topic we are talking on uh, of course uh, cooperation with established organizations is always a good thing good thing it's not necessary or meaningful to reinvent the wheel for the next time um, rather than endow a, uh, a philanthropic foundation. Uh, it's, it's beautiful to transfer a percentage of business profits to a charitable foundation, why not? And the more interesting cases from my perspective is where the strategies are more in a dynastic uh, fashion. We have seen shared business ownership with, charitable, with a, a charitable foundation. So the family is transferring a substantial part of the, sh of the family business to a charitable foundation and that acts as a patient shareholder. Um, the advantages of that kind of structures is that the foundation has a more, um, well, not really a third governance structure, but a real third party structure within the family and the business. Uh, it can acquire also leg legacies from family members. For example, if there is an aunt which has not uh, any children within the family and um, um, it can also bequest the shares to, she can also bequest the shares to the family foundation to make it more substantial. Uh, by doing so, the family foundation on its turn can also provide for a potential exit for a family member who would like to exit out of the business. So it can add to an additional layer of activity. In my country, that is perfectly possible. A few words on charities uh, uh, in the Netherlands, <coughs> because, well, I'm Dutch, you know, and uh, I know you know everything of the UK, but probably not so much of the Netherlands. International research, again, the Hudson Institute has published a recent report. It's called the Index of Philanthropic Freedom, and of course I'm proud to say that the Netherlands is the premier country in philanthropic freedom. And uh, that has to do a lot with legal and tax context of of Netherlands charitable foundations. We are a very liberal country. We don't have charity commissions. We have very few compulsory provisions. Uh, the reason for that is historical philanthropy in the Netherlands is part of the private domain and not of the public dom domain. So that's the reason why it's a rather regulatory delight. We don't have any restrictions in international philanthropy. Might say we are the first country in the world that equally qualifies foreign charities, including UK charities, of course, as charities according to Dutch tax law, if they meet all the requirements. We don't have regulations on investments, how you should invest, whether you can hold interest in a business or all those tiny little things. A charity commission might say to you that you should do or should not do in order to be exempt. We have a full exemption of taxes. <coughs> Uh, except active business income, so you should not become a business yourself as a foundation. Well, that's not some, something you would like to do. Um, typical for the Netherlands is that we have qualitative requirements for qualifying tax status rather than uh, a number of listed requirements. And I know that is different from the UK. Um, we can use charities in combination with private family interests which I know is not possible in the UK. Um, also in this context of family businesses and philanthropy, we use Dutch foundations which are not a charity. Of course, they have far more flexibility than a charity. They can have more than incidental private purposes, so also private family members can be included, 
aligned with philanthropic causes. So the result is a foundation with mixed purposes. If structured properly, of course, and it's not the topic of tonight, so I only mention a few words on it, there, there is no Dutch tax involved in such a foundation. <coughs> Control of such a foundation is balanced by two different mechanisms that work together. Uh, a foundation in our law isn't like a trust. It's a corporate construct, so we can have control through a body of supervisory, a supervisory board who is able to control the board by appointing and dismissing the board. But also includes a contract. A gift to a foundation is unlike English law, a regular contract. A gift is a contract. So all the typical things of contract law do apply to a gift as well. <coughs> so, in fact, the governance may go with strong powers on behalf of the family. But still it does not provide any interest to beneficiaries, again, unlike a trust. So it's a complete orphan structure. So we consider that very useful for what I call dynastic structuring, families with philanthropic intentions and asset protection purposes. Um, ultimately for the protection of the family's interests. <coughs> well, and then just one or I have two examples um, of Dutch philanthropist entrepreneurs. This is Oscar van Leer. I've heard that there are some people here who know Oscar van Leer, or have known at least the Van Leer Foundation. Um, the Van Leer Foundation is incorporated by Bernard van Leer in well, 1946, just after the war, when his three children um, waived their interest in their father's estate in Switzerland. So the whole business was transferred to a foundation. They had to go down to, the, down to Switzerland because in the Netherlands it's not possible to, um, to waive your interest, well, in the way they did, through an agreement. The Stichting became sole shareholder of the entire business an international packaging industry. The main purpose became to benefit disadvantaged children. Uh, later on, the foundation moved to the Netherlands and Oscar van Leer, the successor, he created two different Dutch foundations. Ah, uh, I have to finish nearly because my voice is going to break. Um, he created two different foundations in order to create a, a solid governance, so he was really concentrating on the right um, governance. And what is interesting about his example is that he w was really willing to create a synthesis, as he called it, between the business and the foundation. And he was very afraid, and that's why he um, I put so much emphasis on the governance, and he created an additional foundation just to control the whole construct, to balance the interests between the business and the, and the foundation, um, so that the whole Van Leer entity, as he called the entire structure, would survive after he has left the whole enterprise. He created a, a body of nine very influential people, and he created those body of nine, the council of nine, was both on the board of uh, the foundation that acted, that exercised the philanthropic activities and the controlling foundation. So he was really, I think, ahead of his time in thinking through all these things in order to achieve continuity in the family wealth. Well, the other example is Porticus. Porticus um, this is a famous example, manages the philanthropic programs. All what is mentioned here is on their website, so it's public information. On well, Mr. Van Leer, I can refer to this book in Dutch. There's a whole book published on this man, and it's beautiful reading. Uh, he managed the, the philanthropic programs of charitable entities established by the Brenningmeyer family, which is already in the sixth generation. The Brenning family, family is the owner of the textile uh, CNA, CNA, you know it, I think. Um, and they have a very strong shared, shared vision. The dignity of every person and the rich potential they harbor are at the center of our values. 
We look to foster the development of citizens who can live together in society and make a meaningful contribution to their own development, as well as the communities. Well, you can also read on their website that their philanthropic activities are inspired by Catholic, it's a Catholic mm -hmm. family, social teaching, and again, they refer to the dignity of every person and to strive to build a just society serving the common good. Well, why I mentioned these two examples, it strikes me that the two examples seem to, um, if you look at this as well, all children should be able to achieve the greatest possible relation of their innate intellectual potential, <coughs> as if the families that are striving after self uh, realization uh, seem to be very successful in their in their in the maintenance of their family wealth that might be coincidence of course but at least it is a striking fact for me so to sum up um, and also to finish um, philanthropy gives meaning to money rather than something else so it gives meaning to money and it may avoid that people, that money can become a divider within the family because family members identify with the meaning and not with the money. Philanthropy provides forum for breeding of values within the family with which they can identify themselves. And also it prepares younger family members on their heritage. It prepares for a strategic legacy and the future proofing of the family business. Um, finally, if you, look this, if you think this true, you can say, if you take a holistic view to this whole, it can add much more value than the expenditures that goes with it. <clears throat> when I was talking on this topic once for a bank, for an audience of a bank, somebody, somebody in the audience replied to me, well, you just you do advise to me to give it away. That's an easy advice, isn't it? I said, well, but if you if you may gain by it by giving away, is it then still a stupid advice? Um, well, it's difficult to to tell that story, perhaps, but um, at least it's it's we as intermediaries as lawyers have a strong power to influence people, and I'm very much aware of that. So I think we have a responsibility to use that in the right way and um, well just the use of a family constitution as an example is not sufficient in my view well this is basically what i would like to say well one more thing please please one more thing if you come across a family member a patriarch patriarch or somebody similar who says well i'm i'm not going to do this this is all too difficult for me, then I would just refer to Socrates and say, well, the greatest good of man is daily to converse about virtue. The life which is unexamined is not worth living. Inika, thank you. Yeah. That was wonderful.